Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today I'm doing something a bit different, which is a sentence I've been opening my videos with fairly frequently recently, so maybe doing something different isn't so different anymore. Keeping it fresh, right? Anywho, I keep finding myself arguing with anti-vaxxers, and rather than responding to a video peddling vaccine misinformation, I thought I'd just make an informative video going over the various vaccines and how they've been tested, and how we know that they are safe and effective. So let's go! Let's start off with a basic overview of the steps of vaccine development. Most people are at least passingly familiar with the three phases we've been hearing about so much in the news recently, but those phases are just the end of a much longer process. Phase one is the first time a vaccine will be given to a human, and a lot of research goes into the vaccine before that happens. So before a vaccine ever makes it into the arm of a human being, researchers first have to identify the appropriate antigen. An antigen is the part of the vaccine that basically teaches your body's immune system what it's fighting, and finding the right antigen is a process that can sometimes take years of research by itself. Often the antigen would be a weakened or dead version of the actual virus that the vaccine would protect against, so vaccine development and production was limited by how quickly they could get the virus to reproduce. And because the virus is weakened, there is less of a chance that the body's immune system will give enough of a response to provide protection against the real virus when exposed. To mitigate this, different adjuvants are used. If you are at all familiar with anti-vax talking points, you'll recognize the word adjuvant as one of those scary words that brings to mind the idea of injecting your body with toxic mercury and aluminum. And as with the most pernicious lies, there is a kernel of truth to this. The adjuvants are often made out of substances that you would normally not want in your body in large quantities. But in small quantities, like the amounts given in vaccines, they're included in small enough doses to be mostly harmless, but large enough doses that they'll freak out your body's immune system so that it will respond and produce the necessary antibodies. And of course, I brought up mercury, so let me just give the obligatory mention that the mercury compound that is found in some vaccines, thimerosal, is to mercury as table salt is to chlorine gas. And also, fun fact, this goes for anti-vaxxers and people trying to push alternative medicine, but everything is toxic in large amounts. Everything. So when they tell you that the vaccine contains toxins, they're technically correct because the thing that makes something toxic is the dose. So any vaccine ingredient, even just the water, is toxic at large enough doses. Same goes for whatever product they're peddling to replace actual medicine with, though. Doesn't matter what it is, it's toxic in large enough doses. But... All that said, the majority of the side effects caused by this type of vaccine are triggered by these adjuvants. They help your body learn how to respond, and the side effects are way better than getting whatever disease they're protecting against. But researchers still work to minimize the amount of adjuvant necessary in order to get enough of an immune response as a sort of balancing act. And this is where preclinical trials come in. So. Researchers have now potentially spent three or four years searching for the best antigen for the disease they're trying to prevent. Now they have to formulate it in a way that's going to give as much of an immune response as possible while still being safe. This is where in vitro testing is done, that is, testing in petri dishes with cell cultures. Yes, sometimes even that dreaded cell culture line that originated with an abortion in the 1970s. Eventually, once the researchers believe they have the optimal formulation for the vaccine, they'll begin animal trials. The goal of animal trials is to both establish efficacy and safety. This is the first time researchers will get to see how the vaccine reacts when exposed to an organism's full immune system in its natural element. Now, I know animal testing can be a bit of a controversial issue, but whether you like it or not, one of the reasons animal testing is used for vaccines is because you can vaccinate the animal and then directly expose it to the pathogen being vaccinated against in order to determine the efficacy of the vaccine instead of having to wait for natural exposure. If the data coming out of animal trials is good, then testing will move on to phase one clinical trials. This is small trials typically consisting of less than 100 people. In phase one, they do measure efficacy, but the main thing they're looking for is safety. Is this vaccine going to cause a severe enough reaction that it'll show up in such a small sample size? 
They also begin with documenting the expected vaccine side effects, headaches, muscle pain, low-grade fevers, etc., in order to determine which side effects are going to be the most prevalent. If everything looks good in Phase 1, that's when they move on to Phase 2. Now, sometimes Phase 2 is split up into Phase 2A and Phase 2B. In Phase 2A, they're mainly looking at efficacy while still keeping an eye on the side effects, while increasing the sample size to typically 1 to 300 people. At this stage, the vaccine is essentially a proof of concept. All the data thus far says it should work, so let's test it out to make sure it actually does work. Assuming it's successful, it moves on to phase 2b, which is when they narrow in on the dose scheduling and figure out how many doses are needed and how far apart they should be in order to achieve the greatest effect. If it gets through all that rigmarole, that's when it will make it to the Phase 3 trials. Phase 3 is essentially a repeat of Phase 2A, but scaled up, testing the dose that had been decided on in Phase 2B to make sure that it's actually working, but with more people, typically between 300 to 3,000 participants. An important thing to remember is that rare side effects are a real thing, and that's why larger studies are important. The more people you give a vaccine to, the more likely it is that a rare side effect will rear its ugly head, and then the appropriate action can be taken to respond to these rare side effects, which could be anything from just keeping patients under observation for a specified amount of time after vaccination to putting a halt to the vaccine distribution. But of course, I've jumped ahead of myself here. That's what they would do in phase four. In phase three, everyone is being constantly monitored, and if a serious enough side effect shows up in phase three, the trials can then be canceled. Phase 4 is when the vaccine is available to the general public. All vaccines are monitored even after they pass the three phases of clinical trials. There is an adverse event database in which all adverse events are reported and studied for trends. And when I say all, I mean all. If you go to the VAERS database, which is where physicians in the U.S. report adverse events, you can find just about any medical category you care to look for, from dandruff to the death of a pet. And the reason they collect every adverse event, no matter how obviously unrelated, is so that they can look for potential correlations that might have an underlying cause. For instance, if there is an unusually high number of broken bones reported after a certain vaccination, there might be a symptom that is caused by the vaccine that may increase the chances of broken bones that was otherwise missed. We know a vaccine is not going to directly cause a broken arm, I mean, unless the nurse is really, really bad with the needle, but a vaccine can can cause dizziness, and becoming dizzy at the wrong moment can cause a broken arm. And well, I may not go to a doctor because I got dizzy once, if this dizzy spell caused me to fall and break a bone, I'm sure as hell gonna go see a doctor for that. So that's the general overview of the process. So for COVID-19, there are about 170 vaccines that are currently in development, but there are four main vaccines that everyone's familiar with at the moment, Pfizer, Moderna, AstraZeneca, and Johnson & Johnson. One of the most common objections to these vaccines is the idea that they have been rushed through the safety trials. So how did they get through so quickly? Well, the total time from the beginning of the search for the correct antigen to phase four typically takes between five and 15 years. And the vast majority of the COVID vaccines are chugging along at speeds that are not much faster than normal. But the four that we have are different than your typical vaccines. Rather than directly injecting antigens with adjuvants to trigger the immune system response, they inject genetic material that will cause the production of the correct antigen that will have the maximum effect within the patient's body. This means that the need for adjuvants are minimized. For instance, the Pfizer vaccine is essentially just made up of RNA, oil, salt, and water. The RNA is suspended in oil droplets, which will fuse with the cells when injected, depositing the RNA inside the cell. Our bodies use mRNA as part of the protein transcription process. When DNA is read, it produces a strand of messenger RNA, mRNA, which travels to the nucleus of the cell to have its protein transcribed. The mRNA vaccines just skip the DNA step and just send the mRNA straight into the cell for spike protein production, with the resultant spike proteins presenting 
on the outside of the cell where the immune system can have at it. The AstraZeneca and Johnson & Johnson vaccines are a bit different. They are DNA rather than RNA vaccines. DNA is a bit more durable than RNA. The Pfizer and Moderna vaccines need to be stored at extremely low temperatures in order to remain stable. Pfizer in particular needs to be the coldest at negative 70 degrees Celsius, but the DNA vaccines can be kept at normal refrigerator temperatures. AstraZeneca will be fine between 2 and 8 degrees Celsius. But they also have to be absorbed into the cell through attenuated adenoviruses, a type of virus that has been modified to infect the host cell with DNA to produce the spike protein rather than more of itself. The adenovirus also has the advantage of being recognizable to the cell as a virus, and so its presence will activate the cell's alarm system, thereby switching on nearby immune cells. Now, why does all this even matter? Well, because it's the key to how these vaccines were developed so quickly. Growing a virus in a lab in order to make weaker or dead versions of that virus is time consuming and can get expensive quick. Making genetic material, on the other hand, is fast and cheap. Remember how in the preclinical stage of vaccine development, one of the largest time sinks was just finding the right antigen? That process could take years. Well, using messenger RNA, Moderna was able to do it in two days. So right there, we've potentially shaved four years off of the process. Then there's the issue of funding. Normally, pharmaceutical companies are hesitant to put all their eggs in one basket, and so clinical trials are spread out across multiple products that they're developing simultaneously. And because of this, they fund trials that could be conducted simultaneously, one at a time. After all, if the results from the animal trial are negative, why would they want to have wasted money on human trials going simultaneously with the animal trials? But if there are many world governments throwing money at you for one specific product, you can afford to do both together. As such, many clinical trials that normally would be done sequentially were done at the same time. So that can easily shave another few years off the vaccine development time. The results of non-human primate trials for the Pfizer vaccine weren't published until July of 2020, and normally this is when the results would be analyzed and potentially months later it would be decided whether or not the results justified the expense of further trials. But in this case, they began recruiting for phase 1 clinical trials in humans in March. Phase 2b trials were conducted at the same time as phase 1, essentially combining the trials that would be the first tests of efficacy and safety in humans. When the preliminary results from those trials look promising, they began phase 3 trials in July. For all of these trials to happen sequentially in non-emergency conditions, it could easily have taken another two to four years. So simultaneous trials combined with using cutting edge technology that is much faster to develop allowed us to shave potentially four to eight years off of the vaccine development process, all without skipping any steps and being just as thorough as they would have been if they were not running different tests simultaneously. Now, of course, it wasn't the exact same procedure or timeline for each of the four main vaccines. I was primarily using the Pfizer timeline, but they are all fairly similar. Except, of course, for AstraZeneca's notorious pausing of human trials in September. Notable as well is that in normal drug development, phase 3 trials involve less than 3,000 participants. But all four companies had multiple phase 3 trials ongoing, with a cumulative total of over 150,000 people. And trials can and will be paused at the slightest sign of trouble. In the case of AstraZeneca, one person developed a neurological symptom which resulted in them pausing all of their ongoing trials until it was determined whether those symptoms were related to the vaccine. Scene. Okay, that's all well and good for short-term side effects, but what about long-term side effects? Aren't these brand new technologies that we've never tested in humans before? The vaccines have only been in trials for a year and a half now, so how do we know what effects they will have 5, 10, 15, or more years down the road? Well, the answer has a really big but. The real, truthful answer is that we don't know. But... 
the vast majority of all vaccine side effects present themselves within the first six weeks after receiving a dose, which means that just by running the numbers, it is incredibly unlikely that there will be any long term effects. Meanwhile, we know that COVID has many known long term effects. COVID can damage your heart, your lungs, your brain. It increases your chance of developing chronic heart disease, long term breathing problems, strokes, seizures and Guillain-Barre syndrome, which can cause paralysis and result in permanent nerve damage. There's even evidence at this point that COVID can increase your risk of developing Parkinson's and Alzheimer's disease. On top of that, while the vaccines that have been developed are themselves new, the technology they're based on is not. DNA vaccines have been researched since the 1980s, and mRNA technology has been used in cancer research for decades now, while other mRNA vaccines have been studied for things like flu, Zika, rabies, and cytomegalovirus, which sounds like the Marvel bad guy of viruses. Decades of study have yielded no long term effects for any mRNA technologies, and indeed, there doesn't even appear to be a mechanism by which a long term effect could even occur. mRNA is unstable and will break down within a week of entering the body. The DNA vaccines are slightly different because adenoviruses are a common virus for us to have encountered at some point in our lives before, and the injection of attenuated adenovirus has the potential to reactivate parts of the immune system that they use to fight off the adenovirus virus the first time or the second time or the th whatever time you encountered it last. This is likely why there tend to be more side effects associated with the DNA vaccines rather than the mRNA vaccines. But overall, the risk associated with the DNA vaccines remains insignificant, especially when compared to the risk of contracting COVID. Though, again, the data we have from other vaccine trials like the AIDS DNA vaccine indicate that there are no long term effects associated with the technology used in DNA vaccines. And these trials have been going on since 2001. So as far as long term effects go, we don't have specific data on these exact vaccines, but there have never been long term effects observed from the uses of this same technology, and there are no indications that these vaccines will be any different. But what about the short term side effects? Don't the AstraZeneca and Johnson and Johnson vaccines both cause blood clots? Yes, in extremely rare cases, they can cause blood clots. The rate seems to be about one in a hundred thousand doses given. These blood clots have caused a few deaths, but in the vast majority of cases, the patients make full recoveries. It is important to note here that this risk is a one off. There is not a heightened long term risk of blood clotting. The clots occur within days of receiving the vaccine. So to put it in perspective, if you were to get your AstraZeneca shot and then the following week you're scheduled to run a marathon, you are 14 times more likely to die from running the marathon than you are to die from the AstraZeneca blood clot. Now, of course, it is important to mention that the risk of these blood clots changes depending on your age group. They are about twice as likely to occur in people aged 18 to 39. So just looking at the total overall numbers can paint a bit of a skewed picture. Because of this heightened risk for young people, many governments are choosing to administer the DNA vaccine vaccines only to people over the age of 60. But even with the risk of blood clots, the benefits far outweigh the risk. Given the effectiveness of the vaccine and assuming that the effectiveness only lasts for four months, there is evidence to suggest that it lasts a lot longer than that, but best to be conservative. And given the rate of hospitalization due to COVID in various age groups, even in the age group that is at the highest risk for experiencing blood clots, there are an estimated 37 hospitalizations prevented for every 1.9 instances of blood clots. So it's personal opinion time. As someone in the high risk category for blood clots with either of the DNA vaccines, if given the option, I would prefer to get the mRNA vaccines. But if I had arrived at the vaccine clinic and they said today you'll be getting an AstraZeneca shot, I would have rolled up my sleeve and taken it. The benefits far outweigh the risk. But wait, haven't the mRNA vaccines been shown to cause myocarditis? Yes, there is a link there, but this condition is even more rare than the blood clots, with there being about 1,200 cases in the US compared with over 300 million doses of mRNA vaccine given, many of which are unconfirmed cases. So even if all of these cases are directly linked to the vaccine, it pales in comparison to the heart damage that can result from a COVID infection, which also includes a potential for myocarditis. 
At the end of the day, with regards to the side effects from the vaccines, it amounts to the trolley problem. If there's a train barreling down the tracks headed towards a group of five people that are tied to the tracks, would you flip a switch that would send the train down a different track that only has one person tied to it? Except in this case, it's not a one to five ratio. It's more like a one to a thousand ratio. And even that is probably an extremely conservative estimate. So if a trolley is barreling down the tracks and it's guaranteed to kill a thousand people and it leaves a thousand more with permanent life altering problems, do you pull the switch that will kill one person and maybe send a couple of others to the hospital? I feel like the answer here is fairly obvious, even if you yourself are in the group of people that has a higher chance of being the one person on the track. So this claim that the vaccines may be dangerous because they were rushed is entirely unfounded. The exact same experiments and procedures were used in determining the COVID vaccine safety and efficacy as would be used for any other vaccine, and they have been held to the same extremely high standards as any other vaccine. The reason it was so fast was a combination of technological advancement and a massive impouring of resources to these vaccine programs so they could fully fund simultaneous trials in a way that cut years off of the development time frame without sacrificing any scientific rigor. The claim that they are dangerous because they're a new technology is unfounded, because the technology being used has been in development for decades now and has a very robust history of safety and efficacy. So why hasn't the FDA fully approved it yet? Well, it looks like they may be granting the Pfizer vaccine full approval soon, but the main delay between the conclusion of the phase three trials and FDA approval revolves around licensing agreements and other bureaucratic red tape. Being an emergency, the FDA granted an emergency use authorization, that's, that's what they're there for, that's literally in the name, without worrying about licensing as the need for a vaccine was greater than the need to jump through the bureaucracy's hoops. To complain that the vaccine is unsafe because of how quickly it was developed would be akin to complaining that air travel gets you across the Atlantic in a fraction of the time it takes a boat, so air travel must be unsafe. It's a newer technology that is inherently faster, and it may well be one of the most important developments in medical technology since the invention of vaccines themselves. This technology makes me think of those episodes of Star Trek when the crew encounters a new virus and manages to synthesize a cure and a vaccine in a matter of hours or days. That is basically what happened here. But the fact that we don't live in a sci-fi TV show means that despite the desperate need, we still had to perform rigorous testing to make sure it would actually work and is safe. Now, let's talk mild side effects, because if you get the vaccine, you're going to have some side effects no matter what. And this is actually a good thing. A fever, for instance, is your immune system reacting to a perceived threat. Since the vaccine is literally us trying to provoke your immune system into a reaction that will be safe, a fever is not only normal, it is expected. Second shots are often worse than first shots because they've researched the various dosing schedules and have timed it in a way that will provoke the best possible immune response. And the best possible immune response is your body getting right on top of fighting what it perceives as an infection. Remember, when you're sick, many of the symptoms are not caused directly by the virus that's making you sick, but are your immune system's way of fighting the virus. To provoke an immune response is to provoke these common symptoms of sickness without actually making you sick. And this usually mild case of symptoms comes with the benefit of preventing much worse symptoms that would come from the actual disease, because now your body has enough experience with the virus to be able to deal with it much more efficiently when exposed to it post-vaccination than if it were exposed to it without being vaccinated. Now, I'm going to take a minute to discuss a couple of the fringe ideas that I've run across on occasion. The first being that vaccines are actually designed to make people sick so that the companies that make their money manufacturing drugs or treating illness can make more money from all of the sick people. <laughs> the main problem with this is purely one of scope. Multiple companies were involved in creating multiple vaccines, and as more data rolls in, it becomes more and more obvious that these vaccines are actually preventing COVID at a very high rate. One study by the Cleveland Clinic found that 99.7% of COVID hospitalizations since January were people who were not fully vaccinated. So that's about 13 vaccinated people having to go to the hospital for COVID out of their 4,300 hospitalizations in that same time period. 
Nationally in the United States, the states with lower vaccination rates have higher death rates from COVID. Of the 10 states with the highest per capita COVID cases, nine of them have vaccination rates that are below the national average. Of the top 20 states for COVID cases, 16 of them are vaccinated below the national average. Worldwide, the trend is the same. COVID is coming under control in the areas with the highest vaccination rates, while the countries which are having trouble securing a supply of vaccines have the highest COVID rates. In order to fake all of this data, you would need to have every world government on board with the conspiracy, as well as multiple pharmaceutical companies involving hundreds of thousands to millions of people, all of whom have friends and family that they wouldn't be allowed to tell about the conspiracy, so they would have to be willing to sit there and watch their loved ones get vaccinated with something that they know to be part of a global conspiracy to make people sick, while remaining silent and allowing their loved ones to come to harm. Not to mention the fact that many nations have a healthcare system that isn't centered around profit. Why would a government agree to a conspiracy that is going to cost them more money since they are the ones paying for all this extra healthcare? And in the for-profit systems, why would insurance companies play along with a scheme that is going to have them paying for more expensive treatments in the future? The only people who would benefit from this would be the people at the drug companies themselves, and not even most of the people at the drug companies, mostly just the executives would benefit. But somehow, these few people managed to convince millions of people to get involved in faking data to make vaccines look effective at preventing disease. Meanwhile, they actually cause disease? And somehow, in the billions of doses given, nobody who isn't part of the conspiracy would notice that all the vaccinated people are getting sick with other things? This just isn't a viable business model. As to the microchip conspiracy, the technology does not yet exist to design electronic components small enough to fit through the needles that the vaccines are given in. And why would anyone even bother with such an elaborate plan when the vast majority of people are perfectly happy to carry around their cell phones at all times, which provide much more data than would be available from a microchip in a vaccine? So the TLDR here is essentially... Technological advances have allowed us to develop the vaccines much faster than previous vaccines without sacrificing any of the rigorous safety standards that are applied to all vaccines. The vaccines are proving to be amazingly effective at preventing the spread of COVID, and in the few cases where a vaccinated person still catches COVID, they are much more likely to just have a mild case that won't land them in the hospital, and the conspiracy theories surrounding the vaccines would involve way too many co-conspirators willing to do harm to their loved ones in order to be plausible. Thanks for watching. I know this was quite a bit different than my usual shtick, but I feel like most of my regular audience won't be overly interested in this subject from me, so I've chosen to temporarily ditch the cartoon avatar thing today in order to appeal to a broader audience than I normally do. It'll be back to regular old me on Monday. Thanks for watching. Thanks to my PayPal hero this week, Gabrielle, and special thanks as always to my patrons, Mark McManus, Mark Hetchum, What Jesus, and all the rest, who are the vaccination that is protecting the world from the disease that is my channel. If you'd like to be arguably the greatest medical advance in human history, you can join us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vice rhino. If you feel so inclined, you can also support the channel through direct donation or my Amazon wishlist, which are linked in the description. If you'd like to listen to my videos in podcast form, the link for that is also in the description, as well as links to my social media accounts and my P.O. Box address. See you next time! They'll begin animal trials. Hi, Lily. That can go in the outtakes. It's when I mess up. Oh. So I say hi, Lily, and now it takes. If it gets through all that rigmarole. If it gets through all that rigmarole, the. Uh... If it gets through all that. Yeah. Why did I use the word rigmarole? Rigmarole. It's, it's a funny sounding word. That's why I used it. If I knew I was doing this, I would have bought a clapperboard. I would have bought a clapperboard. Would have bought a clapperboard. If I knew I was doing this, I would have bought a clapperboard. How do you do? How do you do? How do you do?